Hey everyone, this is Gordon Einstein. I am broadcasting, not live, but almost live from Split, Croatia. Uh, I'm here for a, a birthday week, and this is a somewhat impromptu session of Crypto Wednesdays. And I have with me a very special guest, Michael Healy. Pleasure. Thank you, Thank you for joining on short notice Thanks. and responding to various social media posts yeah. and making connections. And it's I like how this crypto tribe spontaneously forms. Yeah. And we're, we're happy to have you on the show. Um, this is the first time actually doing a Crypto Wednesdays without Zoom. So we're trying the camera app, very fancy, on my Windows 10 laptop using my Logitech camera. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how this all goes. Um, and you, you, we're just gonna launch right into it. Norm normally I do a pre-interview yeah. and sort of do a brain dump before a guest comes on the show, just so I know what to ask. Yeah. But this is fantastically unprepared from my part. We're just, we're just going for it and taking advantage of the fact that we're here. And you're a, you seem like a very adaptable kind of yeah, go with it kind of guy. Absolutely. So I like this. Um, just to lay it out in broad terms, there's, you know, not in a pre-interview, but over drinks at a bar, uh, I, I figured there's three things that leap to mind about Michael, and I'm just going to kind of preview them. Uh, the first was his involvement with WikiLeaks, and I won't sort of give it away, but it was, it was interesting. Then there's his role in Unit Ventures, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And then most recently, there's an interesting, I don't know if it's necessarily crypto related, but it's definitely in the crypto blockchain spirit, his project in Bali, uh, Indonesia. And we'll get, we'll discuss those projects, but we, but we'll, I think we'll lead off, I always like to do sort of a biographical section so we can understand, you know, you know, Michael's, you know, the Wolverine has an origin story. Well, Michael has an origin story. So it's maybe more or less violent than Wolverines. We have no idea. I, I honestly don't know. He could tell us some freaky stuff, and you know, I, we'll, we'll just see. Um, so we're just going to lead off. So Michael, tell, t tell us your origin story before we get into the projects. And Definitely. Um, so I'm half Singapore and half British. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, building technology companies and apps for the past 10 years, um, 12 years maybe, and um, got started in the crypto space um, in two ways. One is building the Android app for WikiLeaks, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the government froze the WikiLeaks bank accounts, the PayPal, all, all the means by which they were collecting donations mm -hmm. and helped uh, support the fundraising uh, using Bitcoin, which was one of the first uses. Yes. And, um, what year, what, when was this? This was 2010, 2011. So late 2010, um, mid 2011. So this is real, this is early. If Satoshi's yeah. white paper came out in 2008, yeah. so I said, predated slightly the actual functional Bitcoin, you know. Yeah, so it was one of the first first uses of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I was also very passionate about um, digital tokens. I, I played a lot of online poker and live poker. Mm -hmm. And this was, um, it was very much used in the poker community sure. before um, Pool Tilt and, and Poker Stars went down. Mm -hmm. So I used to meet up with people in Singapore and give them cash to get. What kind of were taken down? Oh, were taken down, that's right. Right. Unfortunately. And so it's a little bit like Julian Assange, you know, yeah. taken down, yeah. and therefore maybe this is a way of handling that government action. Yeah. But no, go definitely. ahead. And yeah, I've not been involved in WikiLeaks maybe in the past seven or eight years now, but mm -hmm. um, I, I was very passionate about the movement. I think why I, I lost um, interest in the movement was because Julian Assange made it too much about himself. Mm -hmm. So at, from the beginning, it was very much grassroots and um, from the ground up. Yes. And then he, he he kind of made it too much about him and uh, rather than than leading from behind. And I think that's and also I think politically it was a little bit uh, risky and a little bit uncertain um, in terms of being involved in, in, in WikiLeaks. Do you think? Yeah. So I've you kind of I think you well I, I can understand the first one. I think the second point you probably knew about that going in. Yeah. That's probably part of the fun. Yeah. No, it was. I mean, I was 16 at the time and mm. I built it. Um, pretty much after school and, and on the side. And then it was used by tens of thousands of people to read the documents and So, so I, I should mention, accessible. we're recording this, I think, on August 8th, 2020. Yeah. So here we are in the future recording this video. Definitely. Okay, and back in the past. Yeah, that was really fun. <laughs> well, yeah, 2011, yeah. I guess, or yeah. so. I was also very interested in building peer-to-peer -peer systems. So I mm -hmm. ran a popular video conferencing application, similar to Zoom or similar to Hangouts or mm -hmm. Skype, where people in um, in places where communication was censored, so like in the Arab Spring, in China, mm -hmm. in in countries where governments were cracking down, this allowed them to communicate peer to peer through mm -hmm. video calling. So that was um, one of my first technology projects that 
I sold in 2014. Um, so you, would you say you have an anarchist political bent, or is it more like a libertarian freedom? Um, I would say libert libertarian, and really trying to see how we can create a new economic system or support the existing economic system and, and make it more efficient, make it more fair, and, and allocate resources more efficiently, maybe. Okay, yeah. fair, fair enough. And then the... And fairly. And fairly, yes. So uh, since we went down this road, how would you compare Assange's handling of things to Edward Snowden's handward handling of things? Um, well, I think the key is is y when you want change, you need to be very careful not to upset people and not to stand on too many toes. And I think some of the way by which WikiLeaks approached, um, like the dumping of documents, putting lives at risk, whether it's informants or mm -hmm. um, people um, handling sensitive material or I in classified documents, I think that can be a bit... Um, a bit risky and sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think a good approach by which to bring about change is to do it very gradually and s systemically rather mm -hmm. than uh, too aggressively or, uh, like if you look at the Panama Papers, so that was more recently in terms of WikiLeaks, sure. it, it caused a lot of um, upheaval and, and um, I think the press covered it quite well. Mm. And but it, but l not significant uh, change has come about from it. You know, there's still a lot of tax avoidance and... Mm. Um, well, let me... Let me throw this at you. The, yeah. We're of course we're talking about the hack of the law of the law firm. I think it's uh, Mosaic something or other in Panama. Yeah. His name slips yeah. my mind. For Mosaic for example. Thank you. Yeah. You know, and then you have this international alliance of journalists that, you know, basically one way or another, their email or server got hacked, yeah. the documents got dumped, um, and it, exposed. It like exposed like crazy yeah, amounts of, of min uh, millions of people who had offshore accounts and were. Um, Usually politicians. Yeah, yeah super yeah. high profile, like prime ministers and mm -hmm. uh, top sure. business people, footballers. Yep. And you know, you would think that by just exposing and, and putting everything out there, change would happen. You mm -hmm. know, there'll be, um, yeah, there'll be more transparency and accounts and accountability and open and uh, openness. But mm -hmm. but I, I think the key by which to do that is to um, to use game theory. So basically, to see how you can create a scenario where it's it's win win or where you can not necessarily take um, money from the rich and give it to the poor, but you see how you can create a system mm. where the rich get richer, but then in doing so you pull everyone out of that. So I think that's the key, and that's why mm. I'm very passionate about tokens, because I, I think it can create this cooperative setup mm -hmm. where um, you move from a system now where the founders and the investors mm -hmm. hold most of the ownership or value in the world. And that's why there is the 1%, that's why there's so many people who hold a lot of value. Mm -hmm. And you move from that system, to where the users, you know, the, the customers, the employees. Um, if, if you look at Facebook, all the people who use Facebook, you look at Instagram, all the people who use Instagram, you look at Zoom, all, all the customers, they're also stakeholders. So if mm -hmm. you look at like all the different businesses that you interact with, all the applications you use, mm -hmm. m most people aren't shareholders in them. You know, it's usually held by private equity groups, it's usually held by the founders. Yes. And then if it's a publicly traded company, you know, there are a few, um, a, a few group of, um, stock investors who hold parts of those companies. Mm. And and what this cooperative system sets up is where these um, equity holders, the owners, the private equity firms, the venture firms, they hold slightly less of these, less in ownership of these companies, mm. but that lesser stake is worth more. So in doing so, um, people like Jeff Bezos, people like Mark Zuckerberg, mm. uh, people like Elon Musk, these are the owners or the founders, they would make more money from the system. But then parts of these companies like Tesla, Facebook, Amazon would also belong to the employees and also to the customers who use Amazon or Tesla. So all the imagine like well, all the that's an interesting broadening of the of the stakeholder pool exactly. because employees is kind of known at this point, but exactly. to make customers uh, stakeholders stakeholders yeah. is uh is it's quite radical and it's quite mm -hmm. different. And I believe that that's what um, is is that's why I find tokens and cryptocurrency so interesting mm -hmm. because you have projects like Bitcoin or Ethereum where the people utilizing the systems are, are actually owners of it. So if, if you compare it to something like PayPal, you know, PayPal does something similar to Bitcoin in terms mm. of remittance of money, in terms of transactions and payments, but all, all the ownership is held by eBay or, um, or, or like a publicly traded company with private equity holders and shareholders. And I believe that uh, tokens and cryptocurrencies will pioneer this change and cause a more, um, uh, co cause a bigger impact to society than mm. the internet or the mobile phone. Well, or I, I think I'm going to be a little contrarian there and Definitely. say, you know, the, the thing that allows it to create that impact yeah. is the existence of internet and mobile phone. That's true. So like, so you know, everything on layers top on top of everything else. You, you know, you, yeah. I don't, you know, you know, 
you know, the printing press caused a revolution in writing. Absolutely. Well, you needed writing first. Yeah. You know, it's like you know, it comes it, in stages. Kind of yeah. one follows the yeah. other. Um, I wonder though if the, I mean, clearly when you have blockchain and tokenization and these sort of platforms, you can craft your. I always say that people react. Along line, along the line of the incentives you set up all the time, whether you realize it or not. That's right. So I say that's a universal human trait. Yeah. I, I wonder if tokenization is inherently making for this more shared model, or whether it can be used for that, but it's not inherent. Yeah. I could I could easily see an argument that tokenization could be used to create, you know, not just a virtuous cycle, but a negative reinforcing mm, cycle. Hundred percent. You know, absolutely. if people can game theory it yeah. to cause. Yeah, human destruction. Absolutely, yeah. And it, it's, it's like human feature. I suppose the key is how can you build systems where as a, as a customer or as a user, I, I'm going to eat at your restaurant versus someone else's restaurant because I'm a stakeholder in it. Right. So we believe the future is where if you walk down any street, you could ask someone what their portfolio is and they'll give, tell you a bunch of tokens of friends who are artists or restaurants they've invested in or been a part of or mm. bars or um, gyms mm. and, and basically just create this new economy where it's um, value flows around much more fluidly and mm. value is distributed. So the same way the internet gave um, access to information, the way like if you open up an, a, a books of encyclopedias, you know, mm. the internet gave you access to that and the mobile phone eased of communication. Mm. I think the blockchain space is going to do wonders for value and how value um, is distributed, moves around. Mm. Like if, if you think about, let's say, a young person with an idea now and they wanted to raise some money, it's, it's not easy, like unless they have a good network, they have a good track record. It's very tough to, to fundraise, you know. But not as tough as it used to be. No, as tough as it used to be. And it's just the beginning. So I think yeah. in 2017, it was it was ground groundbreaking. The idea that people with an idea, you know, could could raise tens of millions of dollars mm -hmm. on the back of that, and people could support um, these uh, amazing visions and ideas. I think what was not so good was if you look at the amount of projects that got funded, mm -hmm. very few actually delivered products or built sustainable. Um, uh, economic models. So I think it's the same as the early internet, yeah. you know, if like after the dot-com bubble in the year 2000, most mm -hmm. people completely wrote off internet companies, you know, they, they used to say, you know, it, before 2000 people were like, wow, you know, if you work for a technology company, I'd love to work for you. And then the mm -hmm. moment the bubble burst, people were like, you know, I'm going to stay away from the internet, it's dead. Um, if you try to raise money in 2001, 2002, mm -hmm. like, it's very difficult. But then it took you two. Yeah, I, I, we, 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 we called it, uh, not, we called it, it was like a nuclear winter. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah I, you know, it was like, you know, there's some other expression for it, but it was, yeah, yeah. I, I went through that. Yeah. So I mean, I've gone through that. Yeah. I, I've gone through the internet nuclear winter and I've gone through the 2008 thing, yeah. and, you know. The economic financial crisis. Yeah, it's been yeah. exciting times. So, so I think 2017 gave um, a lot of digital assets a bad rep or gave people a bad taste, but I'm super confident and I'm excited for ICOs to return or for tokens, crypto projects, blockchain projects to. Um, be be um, be in thing again with more sound business models. So if you mm. look at most tokens which exist, um, many of them have billion dollar valuations. Mm. But compared to traditional companies with PE ratios, you know it's very hard to understand how something is worth because many of these crypto projects they don't generate any profit. They don't pro profit as a as an entity. So right. it's, it generates profit for people who buy into it. But it's tough to kind of calculate as an investor. Okay, what am I buying into? So it just takes a mindset shift, I think. Well, uh, I think there's a rational reason for that, which sure. is when you when you buy an equity, yep. you really are buying ownership. Therefore, profit is highly relevant. Yeah. When you buy a token, you're potentially buying a consumable. Yeah, that's right. You know, and so if I'm buying a car, I, I, if I buy, I don't know, I'll just make things up, like a, a Tesla car. Yeah. Okay, I'm buying the car. Sure. Because I want to use that car. Yeah. And not buying Tesla stock. Yeah. So all the you know the value of Tesla stock is not the same thing as the value of all the Teslas out yeah, there. Yeah. And you know and really the often the crypto is the value of the Teslas, not yeah. of Tesla the exactly. company. Yeah. So I, I think it can make sense. It's very sense. interesting because it merges these two. Because as yeah. a company, a traditional company now, you've got two stakeholders to keep happy. You've got your shareholders who mm. you have to deliver shareholder returns to, and you have your customers who you have to deliver the best product and service to. Mm. And the nice thing about, I think, tokens in the crypto space, it's able to join these two. So your customers are your shareholders. And I think this is gonna it really- It can be. Uh, it can be, yeah. but yeah. Well, okay, so I mean, that's, you know, I'm, I'm hitting this also from my lawyer sure. perspective, which is part of the neatness of the fundraising through tokenization yep. is that you potentially have a fundraising mechanism 
that is not a security. Yeah, it's true. You know, and to the extent that the token is a consumable, yeah. and people want to consume what it potentially offers or will offer, yeah. and you're not getting equity in the company, and yeah. you're keeping that separate relationship, yeah. that's kind of neat because you're you're allowing this new crowdfunding mechanism that is separate from a security purchase. Uh, definitely. Whereas if you merge these two audiences, yeah. you know, the thing is, you know, security, security interest or security characterization of a token, you know, the moment that's in there a little bit, it's like one drop of oil in a barrel of water. Yeah. It, it kind of taints the whole thing, and now yeah, everything true. is a security. Yeah. So uh, I think regulatory is a little bit tricky. Well, yeah. you mentioned Cosm against Humanity earlier, Oculus. Like yeah. these are two companies that got funded by crowdfunding. Yes. You know? But let's say Oculus got bought by Facebook, but none of that uh, billions of dollars went to the people who made it happen, the people who crowdfunded no. those Oculus devices. But w what what we believe? But is that inherently wrong? Because why did why why did they crowdfund it? Um, I think, like you're right, they, they wanted the product. But right. I mean, arguably, they were instrumental to that value creation. Sure. And I think, rightfully so, they should deserve some of uh, what someone else is willing to pay for this value accumulation. I think that's part of the reason we have this huge inequity in the world. Mm -hmm. The people who have money are the ones who invest, or the ones who start companies. And everyone else who gets a paycheck, does contract work, um, mm -hmm. works, works as an employee, is, is a customer, are kind of just getting by and surviving paycheck by paycheck. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. And I, I think... Yeah. It's rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. If, you know, if you have assets to produce more assets, yeah. you, you're fine. If, you're, if your life is expenses... Yeah, 100%. So I'm, yeah. I'm super excited because I think this model is going to help uh, transform society to, mm. to make the rich richer, but pull everyone else up to a nice base. Yeah. Yes, and you know, you're, you're making... It's an interesting point because you know, taking the Oculus example, it's the crowdfunding aspect of it had to have been for the product and not for the company because otherwise it would have been a security, it would have been a problem. Yeah. And to have tried to make it something else would have actually yeah. complicated the security. You know, Definitely. Putting the securities complication. Yeah. But you're alluding to this new model that really, you're right, when, when there, there is on a psychological level, at the very least, a sense of ownership that. And by the way, we're in beautiful Croatia, we're by the beach, and we have the split airport nearby. So it's actually kind of beautiful. We've seen this plane take out, but we do have a little bit of ambient noise. So, you know, just bear with us, dear audience, as the plane recedes in the background. It's actually kind of cool up there. Just take my word for it. But you're, you're, it's, you're making an interesting point. And it, there, is a, there is at the very least a psychological or spiritual truth to it, which is if I'm investing, and I'm using that in quotes, in a Kickstarter campaign because I want to see that Oculus heads up, because I want to see Cards Against Humanity, it does feel like a little bit of a weird sellout if even if that product is produced, even if I have it in my hand, and even if I can use it and then get sold off to Facebook. It feels weird. It's like, you know, there's like this churning in my stomach. It's like, oh, God. And, you know, to the extent that tokenization can address that, oh, God feeling and let people invest both for the product, but also so they have literal legal actual ownership one way or another in the company and its economic results. Yeah. That's a potentially beautiful blend. Yeah. And you know, and I, I, I like you're not one of those, I'm gonna show my own little bias here. I, I like you're not one of those, you know, tear it all down kind of guys. Mm. You're, I mean, there's a role for everyone, but you know, there's, you're, you're not saying the rich are bad or the rich, the rich should stay still while everyone catches up. Yeah. You're saying let them get richer, but yeah. but broaden the possibilities exactly. for everyone. Possible. Exactly. I mean, if you look at Uber, so if, if let's say you were the first Uber driver, it came mm -hmm. out in 2009, mm -hmm. and I was the first Uber customer, the two of us didn't get anything after you drove for eight years for Uber, mm -hmm. and I used Uber every day um, on the way to work, on the way to meet friends, for eight years of the $80 billion IPO. So all of this value created for the founders of Uber and their shareholders, mm -hmm. none of it went to you as a driver or me as a customer, even though we were essential to that value creation. So I think what's super exciting for me in, in this um, token crypto blockchain space is how you can very easily create new systems right. where the drivers, the customers, the providers, the customers are um, stakeholders. And, yes, and this leads literally. To, yeah, leads to more loyal systems, mm -hmm. uh, leads to uh, high engagement, high retention. And, and we believe that this is going to be the case for organizations, businesses. If you had a choice to buy a product from a um, an organization where you are a stakeholder versus one which you are not, you'll no doubt choose one which you have a vested interest in that succeeding. Well, I, I'm going to be a little bit contrarian. Absolutely. But the, okay, so I was thinking, taking your Uber example. Yeah. The, it's not like the Uber driver and the Uber customer at that time knew exactly what they were paying for yeah. and what they were getting for in return. Absolutely. They were they were informed customers. They were, they were, un, they were under no illusion yeah. that they were getting equity in the company. Yeah. And the reality is that they were getting equity in the company. They probably they would both have 
you know, either paid more yep. if you're the customer or That's accepted true. less if you're the driver because, you know, yep. there's got to be an offset somehow yep. because otherwise why as Uber would I give you this? Yep. I, 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 think the, I think the fair thing is yep. to give people choice. Yep. You know, it's, it's, like the, it's like the that's Matrix. The it's like you can stay asleep or you can wake up, but yeah. it's your choice. You that's know, that's it. when Absolutely. most people stay asleep, but Absolutely. you know, so be it. Yeah. You know, if the Uber driver and Uber customer said, look, you can pay, you know, dear dear customer, you can either pay $9 for this ride, yeah. okay, and get and get part of the, and, and get part of the company, yeah. or you can pay $8 for this ride and not get part of the company, choose. Yeah. Then, it, you know, and you know, the flip side for the Uber driver, that to me is fairness. Because yeah. then I can be like, you know what, I will pay $9, because yeah. this is cool. They know what they're getting and so, into. And so I was like, for that, I, I want to save the buck. Fine, yeah. it's okay. You save the dollar. It's yeah. fair. Um, it, it was actually fair before, but now it's a it's a deeper kind of fair because you're you know having being presented with a choice that's not like a Hobson's choice, but like a real choice, yeah. and then making a rational decision based on your self interest at the moment. Yeah. There's no right or wrong, and yeah. the, and really the market would equalize. You're assuming that the price of a ride went up and down based on the, the number of, of supply. Yeah, yeah, the amount of supply yeah. of equity and interest. Exactly. Yeah. You know, as long as the market's liquid, fluid, and informed. It seems like it would make sense. No, absolutely. I, I guess like you make you bring up a good point. So investor protection. So mm -hmm. the idea that you know there will be a bunch of people who take advantage of this or fundraise or attract financing to a project which doesn't have any substance, mm -hmm. and that's why you have the securities law, the how is act, how we act in place, how we test, yeah. how we test to, to protect yeah. um, these these bad actors. I think. But I, I well, protect them. Hopefully, protect from the bad actors. Protect from the bad actors. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Though I, you know, if, you know, if you want to go to some other countries, they do protect bad actors. Yeah. Pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I think the key is, um, mm. is is to have regulation which protects the customers and, and investors, but doesn't completely isolate them from um, potential means of creating value. And, and that point. way, yeah. you can bring them into um, being part of of the equity holder or the value creation aspect. And and one big problem I think with, with startups or with technology companies is they're deemed as super high risk because the only way of getting a return is is through a liquidation event. So getting acquired or going public. Yes. Yeah. That's and, right. and and the nice thing about tokens is you know in real time um, if they're trading what it's worth. So the, mm. uh, the customer or an investor has an option to see in real time how has this performed over the past uh, months or years. And if it's provided some level of Stability or some mm -hmm. level of um, it has an underlying business model. Then I think that's where it can get really interesting because to, to lots of different token projects, they mm -hmm. don't really have a sound uh, business model behind it. And I think what we're going to see next is businesses emerging, which are more similar to uh, technology companies after the dot com bubble with mm -hmm. real business models and creating yeah. value uh, both for them, both for their customers as well as for the organization itself. And you know, this, 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 always, this had to happen, and it always happened. Mm. I mean, when you know railroads took off, there were you know five thousand railroads in the U.S. Definitely. Most of them failed. Yeah. You know, tell you know, same with telegram companies, and you know everything else. You, you've got to try on different things. Exactly. You know, you have to find out that your cat food delivery isn't necessarily the best model. Absolutely, you know, for yeah. for running a big internet business and raising hundred million dollars. Yeah. Um, and you, and you're 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 right. There is a structural inefficiency in capital raising for high tech firms because the liquidation happens upon. IPO or sale of the company. That exactly. who says it has to be that way? Exactly. And who says that you know that you know a real time, you know, based based on this how it's working at the time and the yeah. future prospects. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And it, it, it you're and most of the value adding is in those first phases before it goes public, before it gets sold. Absolutely. You know that's yeah. why the rich get richer. Yeah. And I, I mean this is quite um, a bold idea, but I'm excited for maybe five to seven years time mm. where. Every organization, at any company you come across, even individuals will have their own token. Mm. And let's say you really believe in a young person or someone you met, mm. you'll be able to give them $100 or $50 or $1,000 and, and you have a vested stake in them succeeding. So let's say you went to a jazz bar, mm. you see a jazz musician, you're like, wow, th uh, she's amazing. Or he, he's really good at what he does. You can be a, a micro stakeholder in, in him. Mm. And then when he becomes a huge mu mu musical success, you know, you benefit from that value creation. And you're not just going to help him because you think he's talented or mm -hmm. because you know some people in the record industry, you do it because you're one of his many stakeholders who are incentivized to help him succeed. I like it. It's, it's saying that, you know, put your money where your mouth is and put yep. your tokens where your mouth exactly, is. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. I'm excited. I think this is inevitable, but I think a lot of people um, outside the crypto space and even in the crypto space can't quite picture this reality. The reality that there'll be millions and millions in, of tokens mm -hmm. for um, 
things like gyms for um oh, that's cool for art galleries for um real estate agencies for um yeah supermarkets well, i'll tell you like when, when it, every once in a while there's a television show that's awesome yeah and then it's right in a really good part, and then it gets canceled because some stupid executive yeah, killed exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. So this like, like they did it to La Femme Nikita. They did it to the show years and years. I was on the BBC. You know, it's like it's like the, it's like a dagger in your heart. It's like, oh my god, what happened to these people? Couldn't they yeah. just done five more episodes? Exactly. Well, hopefully with tokenization, I can be like, you know, yeah. I want I want that final season. Yeah. Damn it. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and finances all the independent filmmakers, yeah. the musicians, the artists, the people who let's say have an idea, they want to start a restaurant. You know, a bunch of people can chip in, and restaurants are extremely illiquid assets, so it's unlikely someone's going to buy yeah. it over. It won't go public unless it's a huge chain. So this gives an opportunity for the fan base to subscribe into it and keep restaurants sustainable and and nightclubs and many businesses which at the moment aren't as attractive for investors. I think right. could potentially be quite. Uh, uh, I like this vision. Now l l let's roll back a little bit. So you you did this. Android app for WikiLeaks. Yeah. Okay. I presume you didn't like. I presume your your egg didn't break open, and you knew how to program as a young chick. Yeah. So how did you, how did you, how did you prepare so that when this opportunity showed up, you were kind of ready to go? Like, how did you get to the point where you could even do an Android app yourself? Definitely. So I, I've just been um, building apps for uh, quite a while. So I, I've enjoyed. Um, Programming. I, I also started a coding school in, when I was living in London. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of friends wanted me to teach them how to code, and um, instead of building, uh, oh, they wanted me to build stuff for them. Instead mm -hmm. of, uh, I didn't really have the time uh, to build apps for them. I, I invited them to my office mm -hmm. in, in central London for a weekend crash course and taught them to build six apps in a weekend. That's and amazing. Then I, every weekend, I, I ran these courses for about a year and a half and taught thousands of people how to code um, in universities and also. Um, people from a wide range of uh, backgrounds in, in London in my office on the weekends. Mm -hmm. It was an eight hour course on a Saturday and eight hours on a Sunday. And people would. I love this story. It was really I fun. love this story. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and, and we would uh, give people um, a background in building digital products without mm -hmm. the need of understanding too much of the theory. So, part of why people give up on coding mm -hmm. is because they read about like um, a lot of the theory behind it and it, it gets a bit boring for them until before they get building stuff. Okay. So the entire thesis of this course, which was really successful and, and uh, I think um, gave a bunch of people an opportunity to get into the technology world, and mm -hmm. I, I still get messages from people who, whose lives were changed because of this, was... Um, I, I would, sorry, just to break yeah. in. There's, there's no way that what you described couldn't have changed every single of those people's lives. Like it's, I, you could not have your life changed even if you didn't want to change your life. If you're spending a weekend learning how to do six apps, yeah, no, it's really it's, it's going to affect you somehow. Definitely, and so, yeah, and, yeah, and I guess people went on after the course to build their own um, prototypes and then companies which got funded. And mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy um, empowering people and giving people a way to uh, be skilled and, and reskilled. So, That's great. So yeah. you're doing okay. You're doing this, yeah. and yeah. So so I guess in terms of teaching, I, I taught myself to code mm. um, first by reading books and also just searching on Google, following tutorials, and then building a bunch of different apps and right. uh, websites myself. And then um, yeah, became passionate about teaching people to code. I, I started a popular video conferencing app, as mentioned. So what was the name of that? Uh, it was called Chatride. C H A T R I D E. Okay. And it was super simple. So it was. An app where you press a button, you had a link um, generated, and you send that to someone, and then mm. you have, you created a peer-to-peer -peer oh, peer -peer okay, yeah, encrypted I got it. video call, and very similar to how Zoom works now. When you start a meeting, you send it to someone, yep. and then you got a video call. So this and what year was this? This was 2010, 2000, 2010 to 2013. Yeah, hot damn. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool, really fun. awesome. Yeah, and I sold it in 2013 or 14, and mm. now, now it's uh, still running and, and doing reasonably well. But mm. they've used this technology to build a sex cam app, where basically they use credits to pay. Um, uh, people uh, to entertain them on video cam. Entertain. Entertain, <laughs> yeah. So Listen, everyone, technology is amoral. It can be used for good, for bad, and for enjoying life. Yeah. So, you know, just, just method, message all you kids out there. Yeah. And then I, I started a social network in 2013, which, um, which started off as a joke. So I, I was staying with a bunch of university students in central London, mm -hmm. and I made a hot or not site inspired by the Facebook, by Facebook, yeah. Facebook movie, which got 25,000 users the first weekend, and then okay. we expanded it all around the UK. And um, yeah, it was, it was one of the top social networks in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and I gotta say, guys, I am 
Unlike this fine gentleman, I'm light skinned and I'm burning, so I'm going to slightly adjust and we're going to refresh the water supply. Cheers. Cheers. Exactly. And, yeah, and, and then more recently, I'm now focused on building and investing in two sided marketplaces. So, uh, but hold on, but before we get there, so yeah. you do, we, we, we kind of stepped the, you, you knew how to do an Android app for Assange. Yep. That was 2010 or 2011? That was 2010. Okay, and yeah, based on what you're saying, you already knew how to do apps. You had yeah. already been teaching people how to do apps. And you already had this point of view about, you know, sunlight on issues. Mm. So how did you connect with Assange and WikiLeaks? I, I, I've been, I was very involved in following it, the movement, and I uh, built a, an unofficial WikiLeaks app and then connected with them. And um, without going to, into too much details about the fundraising, mm -hmm. I, I helped um, drive the fundraising early on without the use of Bitcoin, and then mm -hmm. when the different means by which um, the fundraising is happening via PayPal or bank transfers. Uh, stock, which no yeah. stock longer available, that's when we pioneered um, using Bitcoin. And that was through the Android app? Um, or just both through the Android app as well as um, direct um, to the, the WikiLeaks mm -hmm. um, Bitcoin address. Okay. And what was the moment you realized that it was going a little bit sideways and becoming a little bit too celebrity oriented towards Assange? Um, I think just because the way he was treating all the volunteers and the people who were part of the movement, mm -hmm. and um, and rather than putting the um, the focus on the, the reason why people were doing it, mm -hmm. I guess he made it more about why he was doing it. So instead of for speaking sure. for an organization, he spoke for himself. And I think it's super important when people uh, lead organizations, companies, movements, to to lead from the back and essentially think of all the people who one is working with as their partners and um, have this vision which mm. is aligned amongst the organization. And I think the moment this vision or um, dream that's um, being worked towards gets separated, then that's where issues arise. And I think if there isn't clarity on that, mm. that's when people start dropping out or leaving. So if you look at Ethereum, for instance, you know, mm. um, I think Vitalik has done a great job in, in pioneering um, the Ethereum movement. Definitely. Though a lot of uh, one, one big regret he, he has is that a lot of the team weren't um, having vested or flip options. So a lot of the the, fa the founders or the uh, engineers who worked on it early on were just given ETH and they had the ability to sell it, they had the ability to work on other things. There wasn't this lock-in to, to be mm -hmm. part of the project. And I, I mentioned to Vitalik in 2017 that um, it's, it's important, like from my experience with the WikiLeaks uh, movement, for mm -hmm. him to uh, lead from the back rather than um, that than being the face of it. So I think he he, he did he try to be face of it. He's, no. He seems like a different personality. He seems, he like, is, he seems yeah. like he doesn't even think that way. He just wants to do good. Yeah. No, I think so. <laughs> but um, what he's been quite smart about is mm. to not be constantly in the limelight and and allowing for many different um, people in the Ethereum movement to uh, pioneer and push it forward. So I, I'm friends with Vlad Dampier. Nice, and yeah, also with Chris nice. Hughes, if you know, nice. and they're they're going to feature guests on the show. Nice. And no, there's definitely been a lot of good talent. Yeah. Obviously, Vlad's sure. not working with Casper also. Mm. Um, there's been there's a lot of good talent with Ethereum, and they just yeah. came out with their new update. Yeah. Finally. Which is super exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting dichotomy. And my wife and I were discussing you and Assange and Snowden before the show, and you know, I. I and someone, you know, like, I've, again, we got another plane. You know, I'm always I'm always nervous about the word patriot or nationalist or whatever you want to call it. But yeah. as, as someone who's an American, I had mixed feelings when Assange came out and, you know, and Private Manning, now Chelsea Manning, you know, did did the data dump and then collateral yeah. murder that yeah. video came out. And I saw the collateral murder yeah. video several times. And I, 2008. Yeah, and, you know, my, my, on one level, I'm like, this is terrible. Another level is like, as an American, I don't know if I want this out there when we're in the country and like have you know soldiers in there doing stuff. And you're looking at now they have a bolt. Now they have a bolt on their back. But there was that thing, and then comparing that with Snowden's approach, which I thought was much more methodical, much more calm, yeah, much less about himself, yeah. You know, and of course, you know, my West Russian, we were joking how Putin said about Snowden. You know, he's like, you know, Snowden's like a human rights advocate, and you know, far be it from Russia to to turn over a human rights advocate to yeah. a, to a punitive regime, which you know got a big laugh from the audience. It's, I, I think, so, somehow when Snowden, you know, he 
just the way he carries on himself and the way he explains things. You, 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 you know, yeah, he, it's very common. Yeah, yeah. And, he, and he's not deflecting like, I didn't do anything. He's, he's, he's just like, look, it's not about me. Yeah. It's about, you know, I, I'm actually doing this for America. This yeah. is not in keeping with our standards and we need to up. adjust. And it's yeah. not right that we're spying on Germany, yeah. our ally. Yeah. Okay. You know, what are you, what are you doing, guys? Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah, no, yeah. I think before Prism, like what, um, which right, is what, what uh, Snowden kind of uncovered, people thought it was um, um, a complete impossibility that governments were listening in on conversations or able to read messages, and now... Now it's assumed. Now it's assumed. And like, I assume my laptop has been compromised. Hi, China. Yeah, hi, India. Hi, Israel. Hi, Russia. Yeah. Hi, U.S. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's there. Yeah. I know, it's, it's an interesting world. And, you know, th I think that's part of the motivation for Signal and other apps. Yeah. So, you know, ho hopefully, hopefully Telegram's okay. Yeah. You know, we'll see. You know, I, I have a huge amount of admiration for Pavel Durov and, yeah. you know, the stance he's taken. You know, it's just, I, th I think probably, you know, I, I wish Signal would add in more Telegram type functionality. Yeah. But the usability and the reach. I was really disappointed with this, um, with what happened to the Ton project. Me too. I, I have a show about that. I, oh, cool. I, I cannot believe that they withdrew and stopped fighting. Um, they had a per perfect case. You know, those early investors were not um, underwriters in any legal sense. It was it was nuts. And yes, I'm, I'm disappointed yeah. as well. Well, I think what it it did make sense what they did because what happened, what is happening now with TikTok could have happened to to Telegram in the sense that it could just have been taken off the Play Store or the App Store, and Google and Amazon have so much control over the distribution of apps. Um, and I think I'm, I'm quite close with the Telegram team, so mm -hmm. I, I have so much admiration for them. And I think of all the different communication tools, this is probably the best, m more so than Signal, just because. Well, it's um, definitely more functional than Signal. Yeah. It definitely has a bigger user yeah. group. Yeah. Well, in yeah. terms of the security, I guess people make the case mm -hmm. that Telegram isn't by default into an encrypted. But if you look at the number of people who actually use Signal, then it could be easier to point out um, who, um, who are the people using Signal and why are they using it? And, and Telegram is oh, much more for mainstream use. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's like if you're in Monero, like why are you in Monero? Yeah. <laughs> it's like what's up for Zcash? You know, and should you have the right to use it? Absolutely. But are you? Why are you choosing to use it? You yeah. know, there's a yeah, there's a little bit of a signal by using Signal. Absolutely. That's yeah. an interesting point. That's ha, huh, good point. Okay, so that was that's the Android app, and then let's talk about. Kind of path you're on, yeah. unit ventures. Definitely. So what we're focused on with unit is mm -hmm. is a few things. So one is is um, build, building and investing in two sided marketplaces. Two sided so, marketplaces. So okay. we we gave the example earlier of Uber and other similar two sided marketplaces, Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Th these are two um, products and platforms that give people the opportunity to be micro entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a, if I'm a driver or if I have a few rooms or apartments to let out, I could go into Airbnb and make some money that way, mm -hmm. or I could use Uber and, and drive people around. And both of these were extremely controversial. You know, one was sure. uh, disrupting the, the taxi industry, mm -hmm. and Airbnb was up against the hotel and sh short-term accommodation space, sure. right? But they created so much more efficiency in the economy and helped a bunch of people um, be employed and, and created jobs in cities across the world. So like. Airbnb has 8 million listings and Uber had up to 2.5 million drivers before uh, COVID. Th and they're also releasing assets in, into product view. It's not just the people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the cars are being released in the US. The living spaces are being released exactly. in the US. Exactly. Cars is just uh, left vacant or apartments left vacant, yeah. unused. Yeah. So with Unit, what we're doing is we've identified several different industries or pieces of the economy where there's people who have either lost their jobs or they're hungry for work mm. and we connect them with customers. And, and the key difference between the different companies on Unit and Airbnb or Uber is all of these are corporately owned. Mm. So like we have a restaurant for artists and uh, galleries oh, where wow. people basically buy or rent or sell artwork. And all of this is owned by galleries and artists. We have a platform for yoga instructors where yoga studios and yoga teachers are stakeholders in it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I believe that we're pioneering this new cooperative model that we spoke about earlier. And hopefully we'll be able to create um, tens of thousands. Are you a VC, an incubator? Like, what, who, what, are, what is Unit? So the way that we operate is as a, as a VC, but mm. also as a venture studio. So we venture studio. Venture studio. So Interesting we, phrasing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we we have we have this piece of technology called Unit, uh -huh. and we're basically building fifty different companies, which we're investing in and building and hi hiring and working with founders who understand these industries better than the two of us. 
So like the people running our art platform have been in the industry for over 30 years. You know, they've got an extremely strong network. They understand how buying and selling of artwork. We're trying to see how to bring art as an asset class mainstream and also make it really easy for let's say the two of us who are now in Croatia mm -hmm. to be connected with artists who would love your business or my business. So in, in a few clicks, you know, we type in Split, we type in or Zagreb and we get shown a list of, of art agents. Right. So people who are representing galleries or people who are representing artists. And then we can say, hey, my budget is um, $500 or $50,000 or $5,000 or $5 million. Can you help, can you show me some local a piece of art or sculptures, um, pieces that I can buy into. So th that's just a simple example of our art platform, which mm. is connecting buyers of art with art agents who are representing galleries and artists. We also have a platform for yoga teachers. So basically with a yoga studio, the, the yoga teachers get maybe 20 or 30% of whatever the client pays. And, and okay. let's, let's say you're, I'm going for a yoga class, it costs $20. The teacher is getting three to $5 of whatever I'm paying. So, so yeah, oh, with our, with yeah. our new model, mm. we basically allow them to keep uh, 80 to 95% of whatever the client pays. And we allow them, we allow someone who would want to start a studio to basically bring on board different um, providers of products or services and then take a cut of whatever they make, similar to an agency, similar to an art gallery, similar to a yoga studio, but without worrying about the operational overhead. So if, if let's say you ran a gym or you ran a art gallery, at the end of every month, you need to worry about your rent, you need to worry about your payroll, you need to be ensuring that you're bringing enough revenue mm -hmm. to uh, make some profit after your cost. And we basically um, mitigate all of that by having them just focus on bringing on board the providers and the customers. Similar to the way Uber or Airbnb mm -hmm. have the biggest um, hospitality group or the biggest uh, transportation business without owning any cars or without owning any property. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's wonderful. And, <laughs> yeah. and we think um, marketplaces are very similar to uh, social networks before Facebook mm. or the search engines before Google. So before Google, there was Alta Vista, there was um, Yahoo search, there was yep. a bunch of search engines and Google really revolutionized how um, searching for information worked. And, and Facebook kind of brought um, social networking mainstream. You know, mm -hmm. before Facebook, there was Bebo, there was Friendster, there was MySpace, and they, they were able to um, get the mainstream behind social networks. We believe at Unit that we can um, bring marketplaces mainstream. So if I'm a software developer or a designer mm -hmm. or a, a chef, I might not be on all these different marketplaces which exist now, even though there are like Upwork or different platforms, Artsy for Art. Right. And what we want to do is we, we want to be the simplest way by someone who has a product or service to offer to start receiving clients without taking up too much time in maintaining it. We want them to wake up in the morning and receive five or seven clients so, and, and, and be able to easily uh, provide for other people. And so mm -hmm. far, we've got about 12, or 13, 12 to 13,000 providers and customers. So we're relatively early, but I'm excited because we're seeing quite viral growth. and. We're building up communities in 200 cities around the world. And wow. Yeah. So do, does the unit platform, is it one size fit all? Does it require customization per market or how yeah. does that work? A good question. So w these um, industries that we've identified, we operate them as separate organizations. So the platform for art is called Art Find. The platform for property is called Art Look. So mm -hmm. that's for renting or buying property. Uh, the platform for yoga is called Yoga Find. So we operate these as... It's like a two-word adventure game. You got a noun and you got the verb. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And it's yeah. super simple. So yeah. if, if <laughs> someone hears about the, the, the project, you know, it's mm -hmm. very easy what it does and very simple. Um, we, we also are pioneering this cooperative token setup. Mm -hmm. So we believe that... Um, but does, does this token work across these platforms? So we have a unit token, which yeah. is kind of like an index of all these different ventures. Mm -hmm. And then we've got industry specific tokens, which is what we believe is going to get the mainstream into using digital assets and tokens. Because if I'm a real estate agent, or let's say I'm an artist, mm -hmm. you know, I would care more about a token connected to my industry than something generic like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or, or okay. another coin. You know? But are those, are those, uh, vertical specific tokens wrappers around the unit token? Are they truly their own tokens? It's truly their own token. But maybe there's some benefit in them being a wrapper. So there's like some underlying bus between these. Yep. Well, so that's where unit comes in. So yeah. the way that our fees work on, mm. on our platforms is we take a 20% fee for transactions up to $1,000. And for that 20%, it's mm. put four ways. 
Um, twenty five percent goes to the US. Twenty five percent goes to the industry platform by which the product was sold or bought. Okay. Twenty five percent goes to whoever brought in the provider, and twenty five percent whoever brought in the customer. So in perpetuity. In perpetuity. That's so a good. That's a good gig. It's quite cool. So yeah. if you look at Uber, you know, mm. let's say you brought in five of your friends to use Uber, mm. you've got eight dollars off your first ride, or like five dollars off your first ride. If you yeah once. If, yeah. If I introduce someone to Deliveroo, you know. To, to order food for delivery because I, I think it's a great product, I get you know my next four deliveries free. You know, but what we're we're allowing is someone to become a micro entrepreneur by using their network of whether it's real estate agents, yoga teachers, artists, mm -hmm. um, bike and motorbike owner uh, sellers to be be micro entrepreneurs and and they can build their own development agency or design agency, connect collect mm -hmm. a, a tiny um, stake so five percent of the transaction in perpetuity and build. Um, a mini business and be a micro entrepreneur. So we want mm. to provide jobs and create fifty thousand or five hundred thousand entrepreneurs in, in the upcoming years. I like it. It's the same democratizing and broadening vision. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. And so that's the yeah. first phase. Like we we spoke in detail about the connecting providers and customers piece, and then mm. taking a small fee, which provides these industry tokens and the unit tokens mm -hmm. underlying value, similar to a PE ratio, uh, which is very different from most other tokens, which um, have transaction fees, but those are paid off to miners. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing that we do, apart from bringing people together uh, to, to buy or sell or provide a product or service, is to allow people to issue tokens. So if, if let's say you're an art gallery, mm -hmm. at the moment you'll probably be the sole owner, or if you're a restaurant owner on our restaurant platform, restaurant chef platform, you would be the sole owner. Mm -hmm. We basically allow you to issue a token, similar to an ICO, mm -hmm. where your customers or your fans can buy a piece of it. You, you, um, or if you have an idea for a project, we allow you to very easily get funded, and then. So I don't want to be buzzkill, but that's the part we need a securities lawyer. Yeah, well, <laughs> so the way in which we're going about it is yeah. is very carefully, where yeah. we approach it not as a security, where we um, we don't think of it as a public offering or as a fundraising event for equity. We think of it as a new class of shares below ordinary shares, where people are buying gift cards or they're buying means for pre-purchases similar to Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Mm. But then we do allow them the benefit of um, potentially reaping some of the rewards of this entity organization becoming more successful. Mm. And we believe that this would potentially supersede the current existing economic and financial system. Maybe it will augment it. Augment it, yeah, okay. Yeah. Just Support it. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking you're, what, one thing that I like about your approach is you're not like, you're, again, you're not looking to blow up the existing. Yeah, we're just going to And also your incremental change model. Exactly. You know, it comes over time. Well, yeah. if you look at equity financing or private equity, or it, like it's a relatively new thing. So it came about in the past hundred years, you know, in terms of um, venture firms, uh, being extremely active in terms of private equity firms. So it, oh, I see. Yeah. Yes, private equity firms. You know, the first sale of the stock was in Amsterdam in like sixteen sure, something sure. or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but I in see terms of private equity firms and venture yeah. firms investing in startups and and yeah. reaping a return, like this started in the U.S. like in in, in the early nineteen hundreds or in like yeah, around then, yeah. a little bit later. But so yes, it's, yeah. it's not something completely. Uh, it, it is something that is like new in the sense that it's not been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. The idea right. of investing. Yeah going public, uh, getting a return, and then, um, yeah, Got it. supporting companies. So I yeah, believe it, that it's, it's not like humanity has been attached to this thing exactly, for thousands exactly. of years. Exactly. So I do believe that tokens <laughs> are something super new, and they have the potential to um, provide an alternative to finance, uh, an alternative way of financing the way equity financing was super successful in the past hundred years. Yeah, okay, like I an evolution it. of it. Beautiful. That's really exciting. I like it. It's like version 5.0. Exactly. All right, yeah. cool. Uh, and then Bali. Bali. So <laughs> I, I suppose what we're doing in Bali, we're mm. building a village of mm. uh, 300 villas and apartments to start. And then we... To start. I like to the start way that and, and Everyone get that? That was to start, 300. And then we're increasing it to 500 mm. and then maybe 700 villas and apartments to bring the top entrepreneurs, artists, investors in not just the crypto space, but people in many different industries who believe in this cooperative uh, token model of mm. doing business, where the, the value is shared amongst different stakeholders and mm. um, allows for a win-win amongst all, all the entities involved. So we're bringing- is this, a, is this related to unit in a sense? So this is called Park, and Park. Uh, Park is powered by unit, and uh -huh. it, it is our headquarters for the 50 cities that we've identified in Asia. Right. Um, and it, it's kind of like our uh, microeconomic economic experiment to pioneer this um, new system for the world. I, I got a slight 
deja vu. Not deja vu. I got a slight feeling of like Ayn Rand. Yeah. And Atlas yeah. Shrugged. Sure. Which is like the the producers yeah. of the planet. You know, yeah. I, I think you're doing it from a more cooperative perspective. Yeah. But like, you know, the the producers kind of go on strike, mm. head yeah. down to Bali and create this new economy. Exactly. Yeah. Away the, from the strike. Well, so you know, the nice it's like, thing. You know, I say Atlas Shrugged and, you know, who's John Galt? Yeah. So, so, so the mm. nice thing about. Um, but Atlas Shrugged, mm -hmm. the cooperative model is extremely capitalistic. So it isn't like yeah. a communist, socialistic approach. It's actually a, a hybrid between the two, right. where it does support the capitalists even more because they're placing less risk in investing in things. They don't mm -hmm. need to wait to get acquired or to go public. They are having more loyalty and more um, engagement from the customers and mm -hmm. the employees. And, and potentially their lesser stake is worth more over the long run. Sure. So it is a it is a hyper capitalistic model by getting the customers and the employees involved in, in the value creation. And it seems like it's a friction reducing capitalism. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because you know the, between the tokenization and the physical proximity, you're exactly. We in the, in the less friction in the in the value producing system, the more value is left over to be shared. Exactly. And yeah. reinvested for more value. Definitely, and people have more disposable income. They can spend more more value is created because things which otherwise wouldn't get funded get funded mm. you're able to that's take true. more risk um that's true in also. terms of funding more things because the things that you do fund instead of with a traditional venture fund one thing or three things paying off the entire fund so mm. I, I used to work uh, for a vc in, in london in 2015 to 2016 mm. and we would get maybe three thousand deals a year and invest in maybe like five or seven of them and hopefully two of them would pay off the, the whole the rest. fund yeah so yeah, traditional I, I, model. Exactly. So I'm really excited because I think the blockchain space, cryptocurrencies, tokens op have opened up Pandora's box into how the economy can become in the future. You know, that, that's, an that's an interesting combination of two things. It's, it's the point you're making about tokenization allows for, for value realization earlier on the curve. Yep. So that two paying for the seven out of the 3,000 reviewed, exactly. maybe it's the 50 yeah. paying for the 500 exactly. out of the 10,000 you reviewed. Exactly. And then the point you're making about the Bali environment and the tokenization reducing transaction friction, increasing visibility, exactly. kind of multiplies with that first factor. Yeah. To and, yeah. and continuing from the, the project in Bali, so instead mm -hmm. of the developers, the founders like ourselves, uh, owning all of this development, and then the people staying there simply being customers or renters um, and, and users of the space, they become stakeholders in it too. So they're now motivated to help bring more interesting people, organize events, um, bring investors, startups. Well, here's my curveball. They yeah. must be stakeholders? Or no, they, they have don't, the have, option to they be don't have to be. But what we're showing yeah. is w w what the future of the economy is like. And we hope that when you walk around our village, which is which is opening now, um, you'll be able to see, you'll be able to meet different people at a restaurant or in a cafe. And very immediately, you can see um, who are their stakeholders in their project, you can become a stakeholder very instantly. And you create a, an environment where everyone is more supportive of one another. I like it. Yeah. And so everyone's you're, you're modifying incentives in a exactly. way that's, that's exactly. like yeah. nice. It's, um, yeah. So if I went down to Bali and I showed up at your village, what would I see? Uh, so we have uh, amazing facilities. We have a 90 meter pool. We have um, one of the biggest yoga spaces in Bali and probably- um, You need a jujitsu lab. We well, so we have a um, a sports hall. We okay. have a, a co-working space for about three hundred and fifty people. Wow. We have and this um, is built. Yeah, and we've got. So everyone, we, we're gonna get from Michael in the show notes, which we're gonna attach to this video, all the links and Definitely. hopefully to some photos, Absolutely. so that you can see what's the name of the village. A uh, park. That's yeah, right. You said yeah. that. Okay. PRQ. So we can see park. Yep. Which is really. Sounds like a park in a village. That's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's fantastic. All right, yeah. go on. And and we're using this as our hub for um, growing out our different unit platforms within Asia. So as mentioned, there's 200 cities we've identified globally. So 50 in Asia, 50 in Middle East and Africa. Well, th that begs the question. So it could be a Middle Eastern park and an American park and so that European is, park. So that is what we're planning towards. So 50 in Europe and 50 yeah. in North and South America. And we're basically using these hubs to bring together the the org, um, the community leaders in this, these different cities, as well as the top micro entrepreneurs in these different cities. So I think we need to do some Crypto Wednesdays from your hub. Absolutely. And yeah. interview the local entrepreneurs. And, I think that would be and, amazing. And you know, see how it's working out. Absolutely. I think that would be really exciting. And, and I hope that the same way Malta wanted to be the capital of crypto or Puerto Rico tried to be the capital of crypto, we can 
provide a very easy way for people to come in and not have to worry about looking for a place, have mm. amazing facilities like a spa or incredible restaurants mm -hmm. led by top chefs and I'm already be, getting hungry. <laughs> be part of this economy. Okay. So yeah, I'm looking forward to welcoming you and hopefully we have really exciting gatherings in the future there. That, that's amazing. I like this. I, I think that's a good note to actually wrap up on. So M Michael Healy, it's Thank a real pleasure. Right. Thank you for joining us in this impromptu uh, Split Croatia Crypto Wednesdays. Is, I can't say this is episode whatever because it's not our weekly show, but Michael was nice enough to self-identify himself here and introduce us to others, which we'll have on the show very soon. And, you know, I don't know if I should even wish you luck with everything because you're doing well, but Thank you know you. it never hurts. So I wish you Absolutely. luck with all this, Thank and so. we look forward to seeing more of your progress. And I like your, I like the things you've been involved with and how it's evolved over time. And I, and I like and appreciate your ethos Thank as you, you approach this. It's you know, you're you. obviously coming from a good place of Thank you. supporting and empowering humanity. Yeah, so fantastic. Thank all right, so. thanks again. Thank Very you. good.